Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Rose October with Arts, Culture, and Things in Between. I would like to thank you for joining us. This afternoon, like most of the other Sunday afternoons, when I start this program, I talk about what is the program, arts, culture, and things in between. So please allow me to indulge, especially those of you who have been supporting and coming on every Sunday. So for those of you who are not a repeater and this is your first time, I will tell you a little bit about the program. I would like to welcome all of you. About arts, culture and things in between. This is a program that features individuals who are gatekeepers of our arts and culture. They are not only performers, but also teachers, advocates and scholars who focus on the preservation of the arts and culture. When arts is mentioned, it's being referred to as different art forms. For example, visual, applied or performing arts. Examples of visual arts would be painting, sculpture, photography, and film. Examples of applied arts would be architecture, as in designing and building a project. How about fashion design, which has to do with working with different types of patterns and fabrics. Jewelry design, working with materials such as woods, plastic, metal, silver, and gold, in addition to working with various types of stones. Furniture design, working with various types of woods in the ways that the woods are specifically cut and designed. When I talk about performing arts, I am looking at artists who are experts in the field of music, photography, film, theater, opera, drama, singing, stand-up comedy, and of course, my love, dance. So that's the first part of the name of the program, arts. I'll briefly tell you about culture. When culture is mentioned, it generally means the way of life of a particular group of people. So for this group, it is inclusive to mean the various groups of individuals that embrace ways of life. In other words, looking at attitudes and behaviors. What is important to note is that as culture is mentioned, I'm really looking at how practices are passed from one generation to another. The name of the program, it's Arts, Culture, and Things in Between. Allow me to tell you about things in between. These are lives issues that affect the execution of the arts and cultural practices. This involves both positive and negative experiences that become part of the creative process. Today's guest has many titles with performing artists as one of them. She embodies the, the name of this program, Arts, Culture, and Things in Between. Let me share her bio with you. Roseanne Small Morgan hails from St. Vincent in the Caribbean. Affectionately called Rosie by her fans, she is multi-talented in public speaking, underserved populations advocacy, newspaper column writing, radio show hosting, performing as a stand-up comedian, talk show hosting, authoring, and autism advocacy. As a teenager, Rosie performed in a talent show at school and won the national prize for the most talented. This was a pivotal moment in her life as she realized she not only has 
stage presence, but also is artistic. This experience laid the foundation for most of the work she would do later on in life. One of those areas in which she blossomed is public speaking. Since 2007, Rosie has embarked on the journey as a lecturer and public speaker. She engages audiences on topics and issues relative to youth, community, autism, and couples relationship. As a matter of fact, she has presented nationally in spaces such as Florida and here in New York, and internationally in St. Vincent and Jamaica in the Caribbean. Simultaneously, Rosie began her and continues to work on behalf of the elderly, blind, disabled, and low to no income populations. And when I say simultaneously, I mean in 2007. She is a staunch advocate for the underserved in the utilities industry. Further, she sponsors children in families that are facing economic hardships and collaborates with her alma mater, Girls High School, in St. Vincent in the Caribbean. As a newspaper columnist, Rosie has written weekly advice columns for the Searchlight newspaper. This publication is circulated not only online, but also in St. Vincent, in the United Kingdom, and here in the United States. She has been writing for this newspaper since 2008 and still does to date. In 2009, Rosie had a couple of activities happening at the same time. 2009 to 2010, Rosie worked as a radio station host with One Caribbean Radio. This radio station catered to addressing issues of the Caribbean population in the Caribbean and in the diaspora. From 2009 to 2011, Rosie did stand-up comedy and this foundation was laid from her childhood days in high school, if you remember that I said that. From 2018 to 2019, Rosie has had the opportunity to co-host with Mary Murphy. This show, Island Girls, was aired as an affiliate of Fix 11. And the gist of it was about how we are more alike than different. And this show unfolded by interviewing guests with various backgrounds. Most recently in 2019, Rosie has begun an online forum, Rosie Talks, a show of the Caribbean experience that highlights Caribbean stalwarts and icons who have made significant contributions and paved the way for many others. She has begun talking, uh, taking the show on the road and was able to travel to England and Jamaica. Then the pandemic hit. In addition to all of this, Rosie, the multi-talented Vincentian, is also an advocate for autism. This form of advocacy began in 2008 due to the diagnosis of her son, Zane. Her tireless advocacy for autism has led to her blogging, authorship, and entrepreneurship. Her therapeutic blogs, address personal experiences with Zane. Her authorship of the book, Situation Zane, Autism, Who Knew, was self-published in 2014. Her entrepreneurship of the nonprofit organization, Autism, Who Knew, was realized in 2016 and is located in Long Island, New York. This organization and Rosie, the advocate behind it, assist and educate both families and the public about autism. Be alerted that Rosie is in the process of writing two upcoming books for children, Trevor and the Burglar and The Adventures of Lord Muxfor, AKA Trevor. In essence, Rosie's passage to becoming a public face and voice for the cause of autism was inspired by her son, Zane. As she journeys through her therapeutic blogs, she is able to educate the masses on the importance of the topic of autism 
And she also provides support to families with autistic children. More specifically, she does so by sharing her family's journey with Zane, the pitfalls and triumphs, which in turn have, have resulted in other mothers and caregivers revealing their stories and coming out of the closet, so to speak, about their own experiences with autism. Due to her resilience, this proud Vincentian Caribbean woman aims to inspire others by ut utilizing fortitude coupled with grace. She is determined to continue addressing topics of universal relevance. Viewers of arts, culture, and things in between, I present to you today's guest, the one and only Roseanne Small Morgan. Welcome! Wow, wow. I'm like still listening, like, who is that she's speaking about? But thank you so very much, Rose. I thank you for having you. You. You're welcome. Your platform. I thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. I just admire the work that you do. Thank you. And I don't know how you find the energy to do all of this. I'm not sure either. <laughs> I'm not sure either. No, but it, it, the Lord gives me strength. So I just keep moving on. Um, I do. I do. Thank uh, you. Yep. But before we start talking, mm -hmm. I have a brief clip that will bring a smile to your face when you see it. Uh-oh. Yeah, I know. So let's watch it. It's a slide. It's a quick I know, slide. I'm smiling. <laughs> <laughs> let's watch this quick slide of you. Okay. Oh. You know, I recognize, I recognize, Rosie, that you might have you might have been a mother's girl, kind of. <laughs> Go ahead, finish your thoughts. <laughs> you might have know, been a mother's girl, you know, because when I ask you to send me pictures, you know, of when you were younger, you said most of the pictures are with my mom. Mm -hmm. And that clicked. Mm -hmm. like, so we just saw you, you, a younger Rosie with your mom. Mm -hmm. And then we saw um uh, portrait. Mm -hmm. I guess your true representation now, because that might have been a picture um, within the last few years. The, right. The, yeah. So let me ask you, considering the clip that we saw, kind of like the younger Rosie. The, right. Now, tell us about your growing up in St. Vincent and then about your migration to the United States, because you do a lot. And I'm wondering what was going on growing up for you? I'd be remiss not to mention the man in my life, which was my father. Okay. Um, so my parents, um, Claude and Lorna Small, um, I'm the only surviving child of that union. And um, I had a very uh, animated, culturally, um, and also inclusive, uh, childhood, my parents were really people that gave back to their communities. And uh, my mother was a uh, director of libraries, archives, and documents, and my father was a chief pharmacist. Um, then my mother went away for a few years um, to Mona, and I grew up with my grandmother, who was there as well. And um, <laughs> I always had cousins and people in and out of our community. So I never felt really like an only child. Uh, my father was a very talented man. He was an artist, um, oil paints, sketches. Um, he made soaps, he made candles, he made an excellent chef and a comedian. I mean, anyone who will talk about my father will give me the look. So genetically this was passed down to me and then to my son. Um, my mother, um, a lot more conservative, but sharp, intelligent, witty woman, quick comeback, um, all about evolving the culture and the community through um, the library. She was like the first one to bring up 
bookmobile to the um, to St. Vincent from Canada. She really launched where um, books and education was accessible to anyone who would want it. Started the reference library for CXC and A levels. I mean, just phenomenal people. Um, their daughter Roseanne was um, a troublemaker. I mean, I can't even pretend I was always in everything. And you know, they allowed me to fly and tried to tether as well, but to fly safely. Uh, and it was really one of those opportunities that I had and really um, hold there in my heart the memories of how I grew. And then my father unfortunately passed when I was 11, like two weeks after my 11th birthday, suddenly. So it, you know, it changed things. When you say I was a mommy's girl, I had to get reconnected with my mother even though she was there because my daddy and I were thick as thieves. So it, it, it is, you know, different levels, but my mother and I were exceptionally close. You know, I, listening to you and thinking about so many, I, I'm thinking of the connection with the, uh, with the Caribbean stories because mm -hmm. Caribbean stories have that common thread of the village of the child, you know, right. Was, um, with in, in addition to mommy and daddy, there were the aunties, the cousins, the neighbors, the, you know, mm -hmm. everybody just pitching in and, and being responsible for each other. Right. And, and that's, that's critical. That's to, very true. Yeah. That's critical to um, Caribbean upbringing. So right. Now, you mentioned, so I'll go two ways with this. Okay. You mentioned... Um, Daddy was an artist, pretty mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. He was but, a creative soul, yeah. Right, whether it was in the kitchen as a chef or whether it was in a studio doing other things, he was mm -hmm. creative. Or whether being a comedian. And, and the comedian, right? Before less, me. less first and foremost. <laughs> <laughs> so mm -hmm. let me ask you this, before I ask you the other mm -hmm. part. What is your, what is your best memory of your daddy being? Oh gosh. If you can choose one. You are living and breathing it all day. But the one thing, it may not be one specific memory, but I have a very good memory. Um, my memories go back. I know people look at me from nine months old. I can remember incidences and could tell you where I was. It is kind of scary. But he would then share stories about his life and the trouble he would get into and start naming names. And I was like, you know, uncle such and such did that and you did such and that, ha, you know, and he would have a name for everybody. And unfortunately I do, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And just trouble. And like when he tells the story, you just have to stop and look at him like, you know, because you couldn't believe how he would weave a tale and describe. It was so descriptive. You knew you were there. I felt I was there. And these things would have happened 25, 30 years prior to my existence. So he was really a very colorful character. So um, it, just funny, funny, funny. Just he, he would play the piano for church. He was the organist. And, you know, choir practice would be a riot because he had a slight temper. So he would say something and then go off key and he, you know, he'd slam the thing like, y'all deaf? I mean, you're tone deaf? What's going on? You, let's take it from the top. I mean, it was just who he was. But um, so it's just many memories. I'm trying to really edit these memories because many of them can't be said here but here the other thing mm -hmm. i'm chuckling already as i think about what you just said mm -hmm. for everybody that's a caribbean thing too lord have mercy it is a limp limpy you know uh -huh. he has a swell toe big toe or something like that i have somebody seen it he said oh there go miss nosy kite i'm like here we go so we go we just had names <laughs> stuff and we knew without blinking who he was talking about so yes you know it's true a caribbean thing yes. it's crazy so, and then there was mom on the other hand mm -hmm. was more of an intellectual and i'm just saying more of an no no i'm with you i'm with you juxtapose um <laughs> so mom is into the library is into education is making a difference in her community mm -hmm. and so is dad mm -hmm. Growing up seeing all of this, you had no choice, it seemed. I didn't have any choice because coming from, a, and I'm going to go one step further in, 
My father was an only child. I'm an only child, but my mother was one of nine. And I, I, I lovingly call them the board, the corporation, because her eldest sister um, was the matriarch at that point when I came along. So my family, conservative, talented, but yet you knew that everybody had to um, not only toe the line, but make their contributions. And you saw how they worked in times of crisis or if we were doing something for someone else. And we knew all the time it was always about community and giving back. So there was no two ways. I couldn't get away from that. It's in my DNA. I can't help it. I will always forever think about, even if, you know, my mother would say, if you, when we, when I got married, she said, you know, things are not going to be easy, but if you have, and she used the analogy of a roti, if you have a roti, you cut that in three. Peace for you, peace for your husband, peace for your daughter at the time. And if you can manage to maybe cut a piece of that in quarters for someone else, do so. So we always knew that we were supposed to give back and consider ourselves fortunate for what we have had our experiences, even though you might be in the same dire situation as well. So it has always been something on both sides of my life. I've been taught to give back. Um, and even with our cousins, it, it goes on to this day. So I see that. And my cousins, I didn't grow up with cousins around me, so to speak, because we were all over the world. But when we would get together, we spoke the same language. So it, it, it really is something that's in us. I know the giving back, I embrace it too. It mm -hmm. could be scary. It could be scary because... When, you, when we are raised to appreciate the understanding of sharing and, and giving back to community, people abuse that. Yes. And, and in some ways, that could become more of a hindrance. Like an Achilles heel, because they know. Because Correct. They, and they know that you, you would help. Mm -hmm. And you like to give. And it really takes a lot of self-work to really tell yourself that you'll stop and you'll not give because. So that's why I have an awesome, I had an awesome mother because all through my life, she taught me nuggets of stories and lessons. One being self-preservation and also the gift of no. Because they will come and, and, and you will not get into that via grace right away, but with experience and time. So you would recognize, just as you said, people can tell that you are always going to want to give. But at some point, and I think I'm at that point where I will always see where I can help, but now I'm a lot more conservative with my energy and recognizing where I have to pull back because you can't be everything to everyone. See, so there are other people who can be, but they silently sit back and wait for you to do it. So it's one of those things. I agree with you wholeheartedly with that. So she taught me many of those lessons so that when she passed on, she created such a phenomenal foundation for me that I could go back in my memory. As I said, my memory is what saves me um, and pull from the lessons. I could hear her voice. I could hear her voice. And it, it, it saves me many times. So let's fast forward. Mm -hmm. Migrated to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you've done and you continue to do all these wonderful things in terms of changing the lives of others. When you migrated, I'm wondering if you had a plan that your life would have unfolded the way that it has so far. Let's talk about that. Not at all. Not at all. Um, when I migrated, no. Um, the funny thing is, I have to then interject and put my husband into this mix because when I met him, there was, a, for us, it's always been an instant bond. I mean, we've been together for 31 years, right? And um, he's such a, a kind soul person, but conservative. And if you notice that word comes up often, I realize that because of my energy and what I would like to do. I need someone to counterbalance in my life and say, 
You can't fly the plane and jump the parachute and cook the meal all at once. That's not possible, Roseanne. So um, with him, the one thing that I have to say, when I, I met him like in 89, and from then we both have a very strong entrepreneurial spirit. So like we were broke and um, <laughs> we would um, decide to deliver newsdays, new daily newspapers or penny savers or, you know, rolling pennies or um, we then decided to go and do another venture. So, so we had that spirit together and one would tether the other or one would allow the other one to fly. So it, it became a partnership and that partnership continues to this day with not only within the union, but within the family unit with the children as well. So 89 to now, a lot of things happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of things happened. Uh, and we'll talk about some of those, what I'm calling a lot of things in a minute. But let's take a break and just take a, a quick look at some of you and then we'll come back and talk some more. Let me put on my glasses for this one. <laughs> so I'm just giving some little bites. Right, right, right. Fresh your memory about some of the work that you've done. It's going to get intense later on. So, okay. Uh, okay. Looking back at, at your upbringing, mm -hmm. what would you say was the pivotal point in learning about yourself that you will later on as an adult, right, make a difference in the lives of others? Um, one of the pivotal things I think, especially lining up with autism, especially, is that um, my I have a first cousin who has um, Down syndrome, um, and he's Dutch. But we would come together as first cousins. As he had two other brothers, and my uncle and aunt um, made sure. And this is something that sticks in my head from ever since because they're a little older than me. How old were you? Um. He's two years older than me, and I have one, his, his younger brother is my age, and then one who's older than him. So we grew up, you know, when the first cousins would all uh, converge on the island, or we go there, you know. But um, the one thing that happened was, you know, Uncle Erdley, my uncle, their father, was adamant that Cal, my cousin, would be treated um, like the rest of us. So much so that we forgot <laughs> that he was, he had Down syndrome. He grew up in such a way that he spoke English, Dutch, and Papimento. He spoke three languages, you know, traveled extensively and had the same amount of responsibilities at home, wherever we went, wherever they traveled to. I remember him saying one story that they went to Disney and they had told him, listen, if you get lost, this is where you stay don't have anyone move you. This is, you know, what your, you know, this is how you survive. And sure enough, he was lost for a bit and they could find him exactly. He followed the instructions. Um, so, you know, I was told by my aunt, like, especially with kids with Down syndrome, they learn a lot. They're very smart and intelligent people. Again, as I said, I just never thought of him as different. I saw him being one of us. And she said, you know, they learn up to 14 what they're going to learn and they're going to keep that within as a survival thing. So then fast forward when, you know, and I know we'll go back and forth, but when, you know, I realized very quickly that something was off um, with my son, I was able to quickly switch in my head. I, I actually have another cousin or had another cousin who had special needs as well. So I grew up around special needs. And that, to me, um, allowed me to see the grace in which the family handled it and that we all went around proudly. There was nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to hide, um, which is, as you know, a, an issue within the Caribbean community. 
And when this then happened in our life, yes, it was a blow to the stomach, but then I was able to quickly switch on that survival mode to be able to deal with what I had to do going forward. Self. Mm -hmm. so, when you look back at the, the situation with your cousin, your cousin's life, mm -hmm. and the way that his parents and the caregivers normalized his life's journey, mm -hmm. you are thinking as an adult, in some ways, you were being prepared for your life now. Had to be, had to be. Um, but in addition to the awesome work that you do with the advocacy, you also give back to your school in, in St. Vincent. You have a passion for working with young ladies and women. Yes. As a matter of fact, a couple of pictures that we just saw in that quick slide mm -hmm. is actually addressing right. females in, in the audience. Uh, aside from mom being someone who was upstanding in the community for raising the quality of life for others. Is there anything else or could you connect how you make a difference in the lives of others with that experience of, of being your mother's child, so to speak? I was my mother's child and again, I was the, the child of the corporation, which was my mother's siblings and the matriarch who was Pauline Young. Um, that was her eldest sister. And we had no choice. If you ask for an example, um, my aunt taught at my alma mater, went to the alma mater, so did all of the siblings and all that. However, very kind and generous woman, strict. I mean, people speak with her with fear to this day. And I'm talking grown women in their 80s still quiver when they talk about my aunt because she was no joke. However, one day I was at her house and we were in the kitchen and we looked across on the main road and we saw a lady walking to the country and she stopped on the walk and she was hot and dehydrated and she was an elderly lady. And my aunt said, go get her. She brought her in. She had me give her some lemonade and something to eat and proceeded to, to chat up the lady and find out oh, what was her name. Oh, so that was your father who was, and I know your uncle. And I'm going, Lord have mercy. But I saw behind all of that, the kindness of making sure, because she could have just easily dismissed that it was a lady sitting there. I remember my mother saying, my grandmother, her mother was love to bake, but I didn't even know you used to do this, where you can share your yeast and your bread dough and give it to your neighbor. So they have a rising agent because they couldn't afford yeast. So somebody would come and say, hello, Mrs. Allen, I came for some yeast. And you would give out to like four or five people in the neighborhood or in the village back in those days. So I, again, I think it's something that is embedded in our, in, in our DNA that you should give. We were fortunate to, um, when I say we, I'm talking the family, to maybe have a little bit more, but it was never considered, oh, we have a little bit more. No you want something, I have, you know, would you like something to eat? You have to be gracious with it as well, you know? And those are the things that I see going on even too with my daughter and even my cousins and stuff like that and their, their children. So I'm proud to say the legacy sort of continues. I think that some of the folks from the Caribbean watching here, they are smiling at your story. Mm -hmm. Because... It is a Caribbean story, absolutely. You know, helping out neighbors, helping out strangers. You know, um, my I have a similar story to to yours, not to take away, but I, and I've heard friends talk about similar stories. Yes, where, where their mothers or fathers, where their parents took strangers in, and I've heard another twist on the story. You probably have gotten this too, whereby they bring in other people's children. <laughs> Right. And now they're family. So you can if you go, no, they're not blood, but they are. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah and they're getting more meat in their food than you are. Than you like what is, no, actually, you, that's why I said I was an only child, but I didn't even realize I was not. 
Right. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Because we were constantly around. I have a first, I have a second cousin who I consider my sister. She came when I was like nine months old. And you can't tell me she's not my sister and you can't tell her either. Because this is how family is. You know, it's a great opportunity um, to be able to... <laughs> You are learning and you're getting sometimes a lot more than what you're giving. And I don't think a lot of people understand that yeah. concept either. You know, the, the piece about, and, and I'll, get a, I'll probably get under the skin of some of my Caribbean friends out there viewing us. Um, and, and I'll put on my social work hat for a bit. No problem. I know. To say that many of the issues and i am using the word issue sparingly but mm -hmm. to point many of the issues we face in adulthood started when we were young true and we get to a place where we really struggle with dealing with them and we never look back at how these issues would have started now i want to flip it on the other side mm. Similarly, a lot of the wonderful characteristics that we have came from how we were raised. So if we are willing to embrace those characteristics of how we were raised, right, right that make us smell like a rose, no pun intended. No pun, no pun intended, I'm with you. Um, how are we not able to really look at those challenging experiences that negatively impact our lives? In essence, what I'm saying is that we truly have to look at our, our journey, bad, good, indifferent, along the way, because this is how we arrive at where we are in life right now. And this is who we are right now. Nobody's perfect, but the point that I'm making is each of us has to sit with self and really think about where we've come from, where we are and where we would like to go. Um, so I heard all of that in your, in your story that you've shared so far, Rosie, and I, I really, I'm beginning to get the gist of why and how you, you're doing all the things that you do, um, putting it in perspective and putting one foot in front of the other, really, to make a difference. You have to, you have to. It's, um, I think just to piggyback on the good, bad and the indifferent and being able to be introspective to think about where we have been and how we choose to take the different experiences because no one has had just a, a beautiful, well-paved road. Um, survival mode becomes something for many of us that we are going to determine, is this maybe horrific or maybe this life-changing experience, is, is it going to then tarnish who you are being led to be? Are you, you know, am I going to be a survivor or am I just going to quit? You have decisions constantly throughout this life so um i'm i i have to visit many places many times and sometimes i have to put a few of my tornadoes into a closet and that becomes a little ugly but then every now and again you have to open the door and vent it yes so yes. it is what it is yeah i totally agree. so let's take a quick break sure Watch a little bit about you again and then we'll continue talking not a problem, not a problem. We just saw a combination of pictures that depict your life as a stand-up comedian, which I want to talk about in a minute. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> uh, a columnist 
and we also saw um, you at the conference, right, with mm -hmm. women. And, and pretty much these all came to a head and, and it comes on the public speaking pretty much. Mm -hmm. About being a comedian. Yes, you said that your dad was and you feel it's genetic. But Rosie, looking at you with glasses on and everything, well, Mega. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't see a comedian. Anymore. Good enough, and that's how I like it to be. And then you don't see me coming, you don't see me leaving, you just know you got hit and I was gone. Like, what happened? Yeah, that, yeah, you don't want to have to be obvious. I mean, <laughs> right, right. It's, it's, um, about that. Okay, so, and I wanted to just kind of give somebody credit for a minute. Um, when I did that national show, um, I did it with a very good dear friend who passed away. Her name is Louise Lois. Okay, if I don't mention her name, the Vincentians will come for me. Um, and she was just, she was creative. She could um, sew. And, oh. I'm so sorry. Sorry, I just needed to clarify because you mentioned which national show are you talking about? When I was in high school. Oh, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I just needed to mention her name because we both wanted together. And the funny thing was, we came up against singers who are way better than us. I And I will give the, these people credit and talented people. We drove to that show not knowing what we were going to see. She was on her sewing machine putting on this, um, making our costumes. And, and she said, but what are we going to do on this stage? We performed in a cinema. And we we're like uh, 17 years old. And I picked her up in the car. And she said, I said, just follow my lead. So there we are, we made baby doll dresses and we had dolls in our hand, bowls and stuff. Um, and we get on, <laughs> and those were made from crocus bags. And you know what a crocus bag is? Yes, yes, we get yes. on the stage. And to follow my lead, and we started to talk a lot of trash, and I do mean a lot of trash. <laughs> okay, and I saw people just dying and crying. And one young lady said to me, "You're a fool. You know what you said back then." I was like, "No." She said, "I started to talk about I like to travel, and when I travel, when the plane flies over different islands, I change my accent. So I would start talking like a bitch." Huh? place and then I'll go someplace I'll do something and I was crazy and I was like something is wrong with me but this was us on prom you know it was an impromptu thing and we won <laughs> you know and I'm like that is thickness anyway so we did that and um you know I continued in that realm and I started to perform in 09 well that's not true I did the Nick at Night competition um you think your mom is funny that might have been i don't remember the year i'll be honest that might have been 2003 or something they had a, a national search for that and then place or anything but it was great to perform against a bunch of other women comedians but what made you because i have no fear with that that's that's nothing to perform in front of people um it's funny, talking to you is a little intimidating, mm -hmm. which is crazy. Um, but it's not something that I would not do. Right. But to perform in front of which I have like five, ten thousand people, that's not an issue. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So it's I figured, you know, you don't know me, you're never gonna see me again. Who cares? Let's go for it, you know, that kind of thing. Yes. So I've always had that and um did I performed after um, my mother's death um, from 09, I think after, you know, the way that I lost my mother, um, I, I truly went into basically like what you were talking about, the different experiences you have, survival mode to try and keep my sanity. So I was not going to sit still. Um, in some ways it may not have worked, but in many ways it kept me going. So I did the radio, I did the... Um, the column. I did the column. I started the column two days after I buried her. You know, um, then the radio, then the stand-up com um, comedy. And it just was a natural thing for me to just work it out, work it out, work it out. And at the same time, still having to deal with the um, challenges of my son. So, so mm -hmm. 
So would you say then that it, and, I, and I'm thinking about this as I'm saying it, and correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. would you say that the death of your mom pushed you more into public speaking or it was happening before? It had started to happen. Okay. And ironically, a few days before, we were talking, I was walking in the park and she was telling me something. And then she says, I see the horizons opening up for you. I, it was very weird. She says, I see it. And she says, you know, God is in the mix and I see it, you know? And we used to talk like that. You know, we, we spoke so much that my husband gets so annoyed. Um, he's like, why is this bill $600? Because we were on the phone all the time. And, um, I hear this noise. I'm sorry. That's my neighbor. I apologize. Okay. Um, and what ended up happening is that when I actually, when she actually passed, it became cathartic that I had to, after making many decisions, so I'm just over, you know, jumping over stuff. <laughs> I had to make the decision about how I was going to honor her legacy and the things she poured into me should not go to waste you know what i'm saying i knew that she, it was very clear to me that all of the things that she taught me i want to share one of the lessons that she taught me she drove home forgiveness all the time and she says you have three choices i talk about it a lot you know if somebody did you something and they came back to you they, they did you something bad and they came back to you what would you do she said would you help them and not remind them? Would you remind them and help them or not help them at all? And she's like, which is the right answer? Help them and not remind them because she says their conscience knows exactly what they did. And it was essentially about turning the other cheek and understanding that God is in control. He's bigger than you. You can't take revenge based upon whatever somebody does you in due time. So... When, you know, unfortunately, as you know, she was murdered. She was abducted and murdered. I had to do this. Yes, I, had, I went into a dark, dark place where I couldn't see anything. But I, it quickly dawned on me, literally within an hour, that this was one of the nastiest lessons I was going to maybe experience in this lifetime. And how do you get out on the other side to see light? Because you're in this dark tunnel. So the comedy and the writing and the da da and all of that. And she was even speaking to me about the writing two weeks before my her 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 her, her death. So it's weird. So I recognize there was no coincidences. I also believe that there's never coincidences. And that is why um, I think I am who I am today. That's that was the last piece of physical fabric that I had knitted with her <laughs> that took me to the new part of my journey. Yeah. Well, it's obvious that you, you came out, um, you came out of the darkness in, in a, luminous, uh, a luminous way that others are benefiting from, from the darkness that you have experienced with the loss of your mom and my condolences. Thank you. I hope they are. I, I really, truly do hope that they are. I'm not going to tell you look in the mirror, Rosie, you know, in terms of the light that you're shining and helping others. That's what I mean. No, I hear you. But, you know, it's, it's something that you, you're not going about it to be thanked, but you hope that there is something, just as you get from someone else, I hope that it gives somebody a modicum of hope. Yeah, for sure. I, I understand. And you hope that they're great too. You know, and that's for them to worry about, not for you. I that's mean, true. That's very true. They have, to, they have to be content in a way that <laughs> they're glorifying the gift that they have received from you, however small. And that's very, very critical. But that's for a whole different show. Yeah, I'm thinking. <laughs> The, one of the two of the clips that we saw in the slideshow mm -hmm. have to do with your writing, your your writing for Searchlight newspaper as a columnist. One of them struck me that this 
12 year old, I think. Is yeah, I think she had a 14 year old boyfriend or something. Writing about a 14 year old boyfriend? We, we, again, that's a whole different talk show. Mm -hmm. That maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I hear you. But I am wondering what do you say to a 12 year old? And I'm going to put words in your mouth as I frame this. Sure. Part. What do you say to a 12 year old who's writing you to ask you what to do, you know, with this boyfriend who's asking her to have sex? And if not, he's going to move on as an adult and or as a mother. As a mother, right. What do you say? You know, the funny thing is I have to wear two hats, right? I have to contain the madness because I'm like, little girl, where do you live so I could come get you and shake you to death, right? Or, and I have to recognize that she's seeking advice in a safe zone from someone who will ultimately tell her the truth, but it's judgment-free. You know what I'm saying? Because it, it's one of those, it's a dichotomy almost, because you're now saying to yourself, how can I love you through this and let you know that you're worth more than this? So for me, I have to start with the child's self-worth to understand that sex is not the end game here, nor should it be the beginning game or it shouldn't be any of the game right now. It's, it's not a game, okay? The second thing is to try and, because I know I don't know who this child is in reality. How can you find somebody like Rosie in your community who you can cleave to that will bring in a safe zone. It's really about creating a safe space for that child to look, to see where is it that I can go and vent. And then you would know as a social worker, what is this child's home life like? What is causing you to go out there to think that you're going to experiment? Is it that sex is not spoken about? Sex, you know, sex education, or do you not understand, you know, that, you know, you're worth more than this? Maybe your mother, unfortunately, might be a teenage, you know, had you as a teen. There's cycles. So I have to try within three little columns to be able to connect really quickly with this child that, yes, you are worth more. I think that is what I keep trying to drum home to even grown women. You don't have to put up with this. It's ultimately your choice, but recognize that this person that stands here doesn't have to put up with a little boy telling you, I want to, um, if you don't give it to me, I'll move on. Have a nice day, sir. We weren't interested in what you were selling anyway. So I have to kind of like, through humor and everything else, throw it together. Like, uh-uh, he ain't no ma'am, let him go his way. You know, and then build upon that. I'm glad that you brought that up. Because I, the other clipping that we showed was a, um, and I know you guys didn't get to read it, but I got to read it because, I, <laughs> but the other clipping was a divorcee or about to be divorcee, I think, taking mm -hmm. your, your advice. No, ultimately, you're giving advice. What has put you in that position? <laughs> <laughs> right? No. Well, the question the Rosie. Well, no but no you're right like who gives you the right <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> years ago years ago the original editor had asked me to do something I was like no I don't want to do it I mean years ago like 95 and I was like no and I you know what I said then I don't have enough life experience mm -hmm. to to give anybody any kind of advice mm -hmm. I myself was just then a, a, a newlywed person, young woman, 25 years old. What am I going to tell you? I knew, like, I needed to let uh, people say, stay in your lane, you know. But I have to say that I was much more comfortable um, at that point at 38 to say, I have seen some things. And I don't necessarily have had to have gone through what you did, but I could recognize you know, patterns and sometimes, you know, lack of self-confidence, depression, all of the different things that we as women go through and how do we, you know, try to uplift and pull someone through something. So that is why I took the leap of faith with that.
you know, and that is really, really critical in that you don't necessarily have to go through something to be able no, you don't. to send words of inspiration or motivation. Correct. To and many individuals feel that, oh, you can't help me if you haven't gone through it. Not so. Not like, so. Not as a social worker. I agree. Other piece that you mentioned in terms of, um, in terms of sharing um, on your sharing advice on your column, what I wanted to highlight though is that you are giving a different uh, a, dis a different concept of. Mm -hmm a different slant, a different perspective. And, and as we all know in writing, which, which is also a skill, uh, which is also very important in the arts. We're talking about arts, culture, and things in between. Right, of course. It, it's, it's another way of showing the person in a creative way how to look at their situation. Mm -hmm. In, in, in as, a, as an advice columnist, I'm pretty sure that the individuals who sought your advice were able to make informed decisions as an objective advisor, so to speak. Yeah, because, you know, I'm not a psychologist, psychiatrist, anything like that. Um, but the great thing about it, I think after a while, when you recognize how I give out my perspective and my thoughts, um, you recognize it as someone who is an, I'm an individual or maybe I could have been a family member or someone who you would have come to if you had the opportunity. Um, I've had situations where um, I've given advice and because you deal with touchy things like rape and incest. You deal with things um, that there's certain times that things are so, um, I've had maybe five or six incidences that I couldn't even publish it. You know what I'm saying? Because it was graphic. Um, and you recognize that sometimes you want to look for another source that can be of assistance, you know, because this person needs some kind of intervention. Um, that can prove to be tricky because it's not always readily available in the Caribbean as you would like. Um, partnering up with people um, might be challenging um, because you really want, you may hear some thunderous steps running by, that might be my son, disclaimer. Um, but nonetheless, um, it's, it's really important to make sure that you're handling each situation as cautiously as you can, even though you want to be able to share that's why I do links as well. Like sometimes I could find a link that someone could go online and maybe further a conversation with um, some sort of help or, you know, direction. And that's important, I think, as well, the resources. Doing international work, so to speak. Is, I say that again? Doing international work. Yes. It's very difficult. Yes. It's very difficult, especially, like you said, when you hear, when you read, rather some uh, heartbreaking. Yes, ma'am. And you're not there to lend some intervention with the, with the, with the speed of immediacy. Correct. Is needed and oh, I, I, I can't even begin to, to, to imagine what you might have gone through with some of those stories that you were unable to publish, you know, because safety might be involved, um, timeliness of intervention has to be involved, be involved, and so many other layers to make sure that the person is ultimately safe. safe. Yeah, and that's critical stuff. That, uh, but go ahead. Well. Without saying too much, because it's a sensitive thing, I actually became involved in something that <laughs> that I had to pull together um, the sisterhood um, to help another sister okay. for a while. Um, and it encompassed safety and counseling and everything. And 
I was proud because it was one of those things that it wasn't easy, but the sisterhood rose to the occasion. And those things, you know, make it really important. Um, as you're saying, in general, in real time, sometimes it's a matter of hours that you're trying to navigate and negotiate something for someone. And we would hope that we can have the infrastructure. I'm sure it's not just for St. Vincent, but other islands and Guyana and stuff like that where we can have almost an underground railroad of helping people push through things safely because sometimes it's critical to remove somebody from one dire situation and seamlessly get them to somewhere else without people knowing that their hands involved, you know? And it, it's, it, it's something that we will have to, you know, I hope I am encouraged because in the age of social media that everyone berates and beats down, um, a lot of good can still happen because we can connect people faster than we normally could have in the past if we've made the right connections. And I've seen it happen, but it takes a lot of um, um, steps and a lot of God and luck in between. So yeah, it is something. The piece with the social media in the I think is a real blessing because in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. back in the day, it's getting right. Better. Correct. Mm -hmm. Counseling. Counseling was seen as an intervention for people who are crazy. And right. now the presence of uh, social media and individuals openly talking about domestic violence, partner violence, right. sexual illness, and all of the rest. Hmm. People are able to take a chance in the curve right. and come forward. So much so, you're seeing movement now for a realization of uh, human services agencies springing up around the place. Not as right. far they should spring up, I must say, but there is a, you know, so I'm glad to hear that you've at least gotten some success stories with partnering with, with sisters and. Yeah, yeah, because you really look for, and I'm sure in your network, like-minded individuals who can see the vision of what you're trying to accomplish. You may not always agree on how it should be done, but if you have that sort of respectful, um, rapport you are able to come to the point of creating a, a base that we can then build up. Yeah. And what's important too, um, Rosie, is that the person being helped mm -hmm. has to believe in it. Jesus. And it's a big one. Preach that. <laughs> Preach that. Because it, it's <laughs> Because by the time they finish, listen, I don't drink, but I was considering starting it. But I swear, it does, because it, it, it takes a lot. As I say, you wear many hats. Yeah. You have to be the cheerleader and the encourager. You have to be the strategist. And then, then you have to be the enforcer. And then sometimes you have to be the person reprimanding the one you're helping. But, so it really then becomes taxing, and you still have a life. You know what I'm saying? You still have a life, so it's all about balance. It's, 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 you're right. It's interesting. <laughs> now, this warrants a break. Let's take, mm -hmm. let's take a break and come. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my guest today is Rosie, uh, Rosely, fondly called Rosie, Rosie, um, Rose and Small Morgan. And she, is, she embodies arts, culture, and things in between because. She is involved in all of those things. You just heard uh, us talking about a little bit about the in-between, which would be her community work in, with respect to putting on that advocate hat mm -hmm. and herself to making a difference in the lives of others. Let's take a quick break.
all island people. We're more alike than we're different. And she's a Caribbean girl, but I'm also kind of an island girl because my mother is from Ireland. There you go. We're in Galway City now. I live on Long Island. Correct. So do you. And, and, and many I, of you. If you're in Brooklyn, guess what? You live on Long Island. If that's you're right. Queens, guess what? <laughs> People you're forget that. And if you work in Manhattan, holla. I and my first best friend, her name was Tony. I'm not going to give her her last name. For years, I didn't know Tony was white. I know that I'm white. I just yeah. found out. <laughs> Somebody texted me, but no. <laughs> Mary, I think it's her skin, but we're not even going to go there right now. There's a heavy duty. Caribbean presence on social mm, media. Absolutely. And I feel that that audience maybe hasn't been tapped as much as it should be. Zane has autism and uh, he's quite high functioning. I found that in the Caribbean community, they were we weren't talking about it enough. So I started to blog and say, who knew? Situation Zane, who knew? And now I'm proud to say there's so many more people out there talking freely and that was a big feat for me. And she does on her regular day-to-day -day Mary Murphy Mysteries and she's an investigative reporter and hard hitting. I want people to see the other side of Mary Murphy. <laughs> You had the idea for us to be together. True. You thought we had chemistry. True. You thought we belonged together. I had a vision you of you. You had a vision. Vision of you. We're more alike than we're different. <laughs> Bless up. I'm done. Bless up. <laughs> Rosie. Yes, ma'am. There was a lot happening there. You, you think? Oh my good lord. There was a lot oh, happening there. So Lord Jesus. The first picture that we saw in this in the slide before we got to the video about the island girls is um two of them, I think, of you working at one, one Caribbean, right? One Caribbean radio. Yes. Caribbean radio. I actually miss that radio. Me too. Can I tell you? I, I, as I was looking at it, that was fun times. I mean, it was evolving. It was cutting edge at the time. Um, I love the vision of, you know, the Caribbean, the, the Caribbean flavor. I enjoyed um, my, um, oh, my director. Um, not, not the name. I want to get her actual title. Or come at me, but Claude. And um, it was great. It was like, I mean, I can't even explain there too and Ava yeah Ava Bruce yeah Ava was there and then I met a couple of great um DJs like Bajan King and others mm -hmm. Don Bob he did the news um it had a I, I it started off as a small segment and then I ended up doing drive time Monday to Friday and um did a couple hey Rosie let me hear you that was my show okay and, um I would do the battle of the sexes. I'd have a studio for the people. I had Attic, mm -hmm. Pet, um, Allison Beckett, Cyrus, other people. I had Paul King Douglas. I mean, I had a blast. It was so. Let me ask you this: mm -hmm. all of these things you did at One Caribbean Radio. Mm -hmm. Now th these programs had to be scripted. Who scripted that? Scripted. <laughs> <laughs> I look like I like scripted. <laughs> yeah, I, a format. Of course, we had a format. Yes, yes, yeah. to follow. But scripted. Yeah. Um, no, ma'am. It, no, it came no, naturally to you. That's I what. Think, you right. I think my interviewing style. Obviously, um, there were some. Like I remember interviewing Anthony Weiner, 
Mm -hmm. um, and him being like a little wound up, but you know, we had to obviously let him know this, the questions beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, Could you tell the viewership who Anthony Weiner is? Well, at that time, if I'm not mistaken, was he? It was. He, yeah, was. A uh, Congress, correct? Congressman? Mm -hmm. um, that for, much say that again? You're breaking. A politician, that much I know. Politician, correct. Um, and he covered um, the New York City and I want to say um, Brooklyn area as well. Um, and he, the funny thing about Mr. Weiner was that you know, you could have great intentions, but your vices, <laughs> his vices, without going into a lot of detail, overshadowed any good works, unfortunately, that he did. Um, but that was way before he was revealed um, to the public side. Um, so it was very interesting to speak to him. I found him to be kind of wound tightly uh, when I spoke to him. And then... Um, her name eludes me, but um, she is, uh, I want to say she's Jamaican descent uh, from Brooklyn, but I did get to speak to some very... She's a politician. She's a politician as well. Um, Una Clark or was it Una Clark? Una Clark and then her daughter, correct? Okay. Her, oh, yeah. Correct. I spoke to Yvette. Yeah, the rebel. Yeah, yeah the rebel, correct. Um, so it was a great opportunity and so it was a bit of everything that you got to speak to politicians. I got to speak to um, a gentleman who was the only black, um, oh, what does he do? He did the dogs um, through Alaska. There's a name for that. I will Google that. that. But it's just very interesting. The, a race. So while Caribbean Radio, I, I found them to be trendsetters for our, you know, our people. Yeah. And um, it was a privilege to see it. Um, unfortunately, you know, it didn't last as long as we had wanted, but it was great. Well, we cannot talk about Caribbean Radio without mentioning Edmund Brathwaite's name. How could we not? Oh. And I have to let you know that Brathwaite is also a name in my family. Oh, uh, my great grandmother was a Brathwaite, so I don't know what that's about. But I'm just you never know, we're all connected, yes. Okay, we're more like than we're different, yeah. Yep. He had a lot of vision, yeah. So let's talk about Island Girls now, okay? Right? So you've been a radio show host, you've been a talk show host. Stop. <laughs> co-hosted Island Girls with Mary Murphy and she was giving you credit saying hey it was your idea and all of this stuff but in watching that clip you said you had a visual of her while she was saying you had a vision I think of her I kept saying I had a vision for her yeah, yeah. it's the truth it's the truth um even though it did not last one of the things that I will give Mary Murphy a lot of credit for is that she comes with a stellar background of work. And um, she really, like, especially in investigative reporting, she's thorough, you know? And people do seek her out when they want to try and find, you know, a little bit more of something that was unresolved or whatever. And I could see Mary Murphy, honestly, being on a sort of panel like The View because she brings that level and body of work with her. You know, I mean, she has over 20, over 25 daytime Emmys and all. This lady has done great work. And I, I do continue to wish and pray that into existence for her because I think that they're not tapping into what her true gifts and talents are beyond what she does so effortlessly. So please, I'm not taking away from that. The two of you together. The two of us together. Well, um, we hit it off because she, I met her when she was doing an article about deportees and them going back from the United States, North America, England, and unfortunately cre creating these horrific situations at home. And she and I met and I did a segment with her and, um, 
we we clicked. We really did click and we stayed in touch and we'd have good laughs. I mean, crazy laughs we had this scene. And um and she's very interested and in and plugged into the Caribbean culture and respectfully so because not everyone gets us and gets us with the respect that I think is due us, you know, and um, we just realized that organically that this was an opportunity to create Island Girls. And um, when we went and had a few meetings at PIX, they thought so too. So it was a great um, opportunity to have that done. I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Stand out. Experience for you in doing Island Girls with Mary. What's a standout moment? I'm the first show, definitely. Um, we had a live audience. Um, the response was crazy. The energy was phenomenal. The first um, guest was a, a young lady, uh, you know, Hazel McKenzie, who had won America's Worst Cook from the Food Network. She came out and she has an incredible story um, about survival. Um, she was writing her book. Her book has since come out. And then she's also a social worker um, who is creating this smart doll that's going to change the world. So it was, it was plugged in, it was fun, it was interactive, but it was just the energy of the night and the anticipation. It was, um, it is exactly what we wanted. We are more like than we're different. And it was a diverse crowd. So I enjoyed that because you just didn't want it to be all of one set of people. You wanted to be a cross section. So it was a great evening. Yeah. Now, I have shown two pictures of me with Bishop Curry. Right, right, right was one of the guests on uh, one of the shows yes that was he was the third show yeah okay he was on no i wonder if there is if that was a hallmark moment for you mm, huge because okay. um when i tell you um bishop curry what a gentleman really and also he's larger than life but he sucks you in and you forget the greatness of this man. Um, he, he really um, gives you that feeling of a hometown man or someone that you knew growing up, like you recognize your uncle in him, but yet he can elevate you to a point now that you want to hear what he has to say in terms of not only God's word, but how love works and how it works now aptly in the times that we're in. So it, it was all, and then of course he did the royal wedding and all of those good things. So it was really a great time and it took a lot of work to get done. But, and I remember him leaning over and said, thank you for never giving up on this show. Thank you for um, making this happen. Cause he really wanted to do the interview and I was very humbled by that. So yes. And, incredible human being he is. So the thing I'm thinking might come over a little uh, edgy. So we're more alike than different. Mm -hmm. Here you are, and I, I, I like to say black looking, so my viewers, please don't come for me. I'm <laughs> black looking because you're a Caribbean woman who is mm -hmm. black, right? right. Um, in this country, we're called African-Americans. Uh, because there is no box for us to check Caribbean or African Caribbean or whatever, we, you know, right. options. So that's why I coached it that way. And here, mm -hmm. Mary Murphy. Mm -hmm. And the two of you are talking about being more alike. Than different, right. And uh, she was being very witty when she said she's from an island. She's from Ireland. Right. And you are from... Simple. Right. Now, I'm trying to figure out other than that the differences that we see. The visual, obvious differences, right? Right. What were some of these alike 
Nesses. I just made up that word. Right, 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 right. That you two were talking about. I think the funny thing was, I mean, it might have started off as small as um, she grew up in Queens Village, a few streets over from where I came. Um, and we, I actually saw Queens Village evolve from 1981 when I used to visit to present, but we had some connecting stories there. But the more I like was um, talking about our children and the concerns we had for our children and what we have to do to overcome that. Where, you know, forgive me, in white America may not realize that black America wants their children to be educated, wants their children to be safe. They want to live in a safe neighborhood and not to be judged or, you know, policed or, don't take for granted that you could drive your car in a certain neighborhood and mean in white America and not be pulled over. And I could be in the same car and be pulled over that we really do want the same things. We're not out to, and we talked about that. We're not out to try to rob you or hurt you. It, it happens on both sides of the fence. We spoke about not only, sorry, family. We spoke about careers. We spoke about experiences in terms of women trying to get to another level, you know, in our careers and being, you know, you're hitting that ceiling for whatever reason, sexism. You you have so many experiences, but the first thing out the door that hits you is that you look at the color of the person's skin, you know, <laughs> and that right away, you know, I step into rooms for meetings. I talk about this all the time and I'm immediately judged. So yes, I'm black. And then they see someone maybe with hair like mine. And then they see maybe someone who's slightly or someone overweight. And then they deem that you may not be intelligent enough. But what I do, and I shouldn't even say the secret, but I sit back and I just say nothing because I'm assessing the whole room. And then I speak. And I could hear the, like, because they're surprised. What is this? And those are the things that we, and I know you know what I'm speaking about, meet upon often, you know, if not sometimes daily. Those are things that we have to, and, and I know that for white women as well. They also have to fight against their counterparts, which I do, a male who may not know as much as me. But because he's male, he'll be pushed ahead. So we are more alike, that's one section. But then we could go on a wider community. You know, we have, we live in New York, my Lord, the most diverse place that I think you will find. Maybe London might be a little, I like that, but it's one of those things where we want the same things. It's a melting pot. And that's really what we were pulling on, trying to live and learn because we had wanted to be able to go into communities and like see foods and trends and recognize these people are just doing it the same way, just maybe with a different language, mm. you know? So it that's the premise. Yeah. I, I, I think you've, you've hit some very important points and, and you know, just to put a time stamp on um, one of the points you've made earlier about the realization of the white community and what the black community wants. I mean, fast forward, I think the message, the message is, the messaging now has been changed and, and attention has been given to right. it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been some some movement, not as fast as, you know, right. my kids to move, but there have been some movement. But the reason I ask you that, and I did say but, the reason I ask you that is because, like you mentioned, the first thing anybody looking at this would see is that this is a white woman this is a black woman. Hmm. Some folks who are biased might be thinking, oh, I don't think we're that alike, or I don't think, you know, that kind of a thing. But it really takes some kind of tolerance level to be elevated, to engage in mm -hmm. the discourse and to be receiving the messages, you know, other than the, the color, the color, the skin color, the color tones. But Rose, can I interject here? One of the things I think too, is that as a West Indian or a Caribbean person, 
we have grown up, we have had the privilege of growing up with people who are white West Indians and um, Indian West Indians and Chinese West Indians. So much so that we came here almost like a blank slate because it was okay. We understood living together. You just have to be Mrs. So-and-so's daughter, or that boy with the bullet daughter. You know how we are. And then unfortunately over time, the re, you know, jigging of how we looked at things, the biases then started. You might have been looking at your first cousin who looked, you know, kind of like Mary. That's yeah, crazy. Yeah. So we have to somehow start at some stage in the game to start to take back some of those talents, you know, not to release the tolerances, to then start saying, listen, we can do this. It's not impossible. People keep pouring in poison. We have to reject it. Oil and water. We have to let it repel. We really do because we're heading in a, well, we're on the road to a direction that's very scary. Yeah. And we want, we really want to encourage growth too. So that, hence the reason for us to be um, open and receptive, understanding, not being stupid. True. More knowledgeable than True. anyone. Let's know our history, yeah. Yes. Let's take a break, ladies and gentlemen. No Boys and girls, I'm sitting with Roseanne, uh, who is my guest today, and she encompasses what this program is about, arts, culture, and things in between. For those of you who've missed, who might have missed the earlier part of the, in, uh, the discussion, Roseanne talked about being a stand-up comedian. I was thinking about that. And She's done some writing, which falls under the literature piece, and we're talking, uh, we're really getting into the meat and potatoes, so to speak, of Roseanne's work, which has to do with her advocacy. But we'll take a break and come right back and talk with Rosie some more. Thank you. That was a quick one. Right. Mike, you're the podium, you with the mic. Right. And I look at those two pictures and I'm thinking of a leader. That's what I'm thinking of, Rosie. When I look at those two pictures, the way that you are standing at the podium, the way that you're standing in front of obviously an audience and you're obviously commanding the space. Now, this question is specifically about the advocacy that you do for families, living with an autistic child, uh, addressing the needs of the underserved populations. But let's talk about how you advocate for individuals who are underserved in our community. How did that start for you? Well, of course, um, Zane, um, my son, he, when he was born, he was on track, in fact, advanced, um, spoke at um, about nine months and walked around the same time. And so we were, you know, he was just like hyper and all into stuff. He reminded me of me. So I was like, okay, so this is my retribution here. This is what I'm in I have inherited. But then we noticed when he had his shot at 13 months old, which was the um, measles, mumps, and rubella, the MMR shot, that one month later, he stopped speaking, stopped giving eye contact, was grunting, and just, it was confusing. Fast forward, ask the pediatrician, and she's like, no, I don't think anything is wrong, blah, blah, blah. Um, but in my gut, I started saying something is wrong because when a child looks through you, when you're speaking to them and they're not even acknowledging you, that is cause for concern. Anyway, um, we continued along and we noticed that he really had a, he was hyperactive, running, not stopping, screaming, just all of the little benchmarks that um, should have been happening, were not lining up. And even with the doctor, we're like, no, we have to have him checked out. 
I have to give a lot of credit. He went to the Salvation Army um, daycare center and um, their director and one of the teachers uh, and um, their office manager pulled me aside and said, um, we think that he may be autistic. It had gone through my head prior to this, but to hear somebody say it. So they gave me a, a card to have him tested. Um, and I said, at this point, he wasn't saying mommy or daddy. Because um, he would just point and let me know what he wanted. And three, three, four years old. Oh, yeah, three or four. So I went and um, we had him tested. And I remember saying flippantly to the lady, I was like, if you have him say, mommy, I'll give you 20 bucks because he's not going to say it. And she did this. Who's that? He goes, mommy. I go, oh my God. He could say, it. you know, like I didn't know he had, he was still verbal. After which I quickly got on board realizing that we had to do the battery of tests. Um, you know, the... CAT scans, the different, the, if he could hear, if he can see, you know, all of those things to make sure. Um, and of course, it with autism, there's nothing that shows up in your blood work that says this child is autistic, but they hit the benchmark of what autism is, which is on the spectrum. And, you know, the spectrum is vast. You can be mute, you can have, you can be handicapped, you could be um, visually impaired, it could be anything to someone who is so brilliant that they can do masterful things, but they lack that human emotion and detection. Basically, in 08, when he was six, after, and it took a while because no one helps you. That's the other thing. We were reaching in the dark. No one said, this is what you have to do. This is what you, no one did. So he lost valuable time um, where he could have had intervention, early intervention. No one said. I've that heard he, other parents say that. You have heard other parents say that. So it was frustrating because he lost a lot of ground because he's very bright. But, you know, um, he's made great strides. Please don't make me not say that. But it has been so, okay, so. We would reach out to other parents and they would tell you little things and you go, okay, but how they didn't want to like help you in that way. We finally um, started and got him into a school. And then from networking with his teachers, we got at the age 12, a behavioral, um, a parent trainer. She sits on my board, Ruth Allen. Um, who really structurally came in and created a, a roadmap for us to get him to start pulling the best out of him and for us changing behaviors and stuff. Because there was no bedtime. He did it whenever he wanted to. He didn't, you know, it was all of these things that we had to rework. And then I had to start talking about it because I made so many public appearances. I started to talk about my son in little clips. The boy shampooed the cat, or the boy did this, autism, who knew? And then people would start asking, your son is autistic? He doesn't look autistic. And I mean, if anyone could see, if you look at this face, this smiling face, you can't see. You know, it's not something that until you start looking at the behavior. And that then started the road to advocacy, I guess, because other mothers started to talk to us about their children and grandchildren and stuff like that. Um, in addition to your advocacy work uh, with families uh, that have an autistic child, you also do advocacy for the underserved populations, like for those individuals who are disabled or have. Mm -hmm. What is the connection between, if there is, the advocacy that you do for families with autistic children and the underserved. Is there a connection? If not. Absolutely, there is, there is. Um, I work with the elderly, blind and disabled um, population and those who are struggling economically, okay? Um, and 
my job is to try and connect dots for people. So, you know, I'm the person that you would come to in my regular nine to five to talk about grants or the situation that's going on with their bill or the fact that they've been cut off or there's a, somebody who's blind and over 62 living alone um, in dire need. I am that person that you'll come and speak to. And I'll try and make a way from nowhere in terms of your bill or helping you with a payment plan or a grant or whatever. But then you're saying to me in the same breath, I'm the grandmother and I'm living with a child who has ADHD and I think he might you know, have special needs and I have no food. So then I would then put you in touch with a pantry that I work closely with. And then I would say to them, listen, I need you to go to OPWDD, Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, and start the process. You know, this is what you're going to need because um, your child can get screened and blah, 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 get an IEP. And, you know, you start talking the language and the jargon so they understand that this child has a lot more help and you can get help in the home in addition to not only food and you know shelter and all that you can get a peace of mind that there's someone else out there who can assist you you know with a roadmap that you're not feeling in the dark so my role of autism intermingles daily daily with my regular job and happily so because i even met a lady with twins they were 30 Seven, and she had divorced her husband and she had no other family and I said did you ever do guardianship and she goes what because then I said these children will be put the state will make decisions for um, your sons you know and you she actually went and did it which I was so proud of so these are the things that you do on a daily basis to try and make somebody's life a little easier no which came first, your son's diagnosis of autism or you're working with the underserved population? My son, my son. Your son. So in some ways, your <laughs> diagnosis <laughs> is the foundation. Absolutely, 100%, 100%. He put me out there um, with a platform that allowed me, because like in my job, I do expos where I bring agencies together all under one roof well we don't do that right now but this pandemic but all under one roof where people can not only get help with let's say bills and food and medical but they can get someone who can help them with maybe special needs or someone who can help them with efficiency energy efficiency so he definitely started that ball rolling for me being out there i mean i've spoken at st francis college in brooklyn um, we had a um, seminar there. I did one in Jamaica. We even had the opportunity to lecture at Mona with my whole, well, a, a few of the team members, for teachers doing postgrad um, in special education. So it really has opened the gamut. Yes. So he definitely was the one that allowed me to speak. And I didn't, it never started out like that, as you know. It's just, you were talking to other mothers and fathers who did not want to speak publicly yeah. about it because it was, you know, I was just speaking to someone today. I said, and I'm pretty sure you could answer to this. There were people that had children with special needs that they used to lock away in rooms. You didn't know they existed. Yeah. Or, or they, they truly hide them away. Yes. From yes. And yeah. I can't do that to my son. I can't. I mean, we take him everywhere. He has traveled ex and continues to travel extensively. So much so he's obnoxious with it. He tells you for the year what your itinerary will be. So now <laughs> you're like, this don't make no sense. Does this boy work anywhere? No, he doesn't. But he's telling you. Um, he, he, you know, he's very good. Not very good. He's exceptionally good at anything technical. I use the word very lightly, but it's the truth. He will hack into systems and shut you down and reroute you. That's why he's nowhere near this laptop right now. I mean, there's just stuff that goes on. But I wanted him to have as many of the mainstream experiences that his peers are having 
and um, try my best to integrate him into the community so they can be respectful of who he is. Look, I am on how we started. You told mm -hmm. your cousin. You remember? Mm -hmm. At my right, you see. Yep, 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 yep. But I want us to take another break because of what's come. And I'm hoping that uh, my friends out there who are watching and listening to us, who may have a loved one with special needs, get right. here that you need to embrace that individual, whether it's your child, your grandchild, a friend, a family friend, you know, an extended family member, a family member, whomever this person is to you. Right. Embrace this person, embrace the individual, embrace your loved one, and help seek the level of care that is needed. We'll hear more from Rosie. Absolutely. We'll hear more from Rosie in a minute, and it will inspire you. For those of you who've joined late, you're here with me, Rose October, and we're at Arts, Culture, and Things in Between, three to five on Sundays, and we're sitting with my guest today, Rose and Small Morgan, who embodies Arts, Culture, and Things in Between. Let's take a break and come back. On behalf of what they are doing to be here today at Ireland High School to present this award via Ireland High School to Romaria Watson here, um, who is a thriving student under the tutelage of Ireland High School, um, who is on the spectrum, and I assume who's going to do eight subjects. For the people out there, you know that's very impressive. We are awarding um, 300 US towards him getting um, paid for his uh, assisting uh, his CXC CSBC. Did I say that correctly? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so proud. <laughs> um, subjects. So um, the award also says um, to Ireland High School for fostering an environment that allows people on the autistic autism spectrum to thrive. And it was awarded this day on the 28th of November, 2019. So we really, I don't know who I would thank you to, Dr. Pinto, but thank you so very thank much. You so thank you so much. very, very much um, on behalf of Autism Community and also the Morgan family. Um, we're very proud and we really wish you from Mario all the best for your team. Well, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So this is our second um, video blog. Um, I promise that we're going to do it every now and again. So today my co-host for a little bit until he decides to leave is, what's your name? Uh, Chris Zanapises and the amazing. No, what's your government name? What's your name? Donald Trump. What's your <laughs> Boy, what's your name? Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Thank you. Donald Trump. Oh my Lord. Anyway, um, so we just thought that we were going to talk a little bit about um, empathy. Emp empathy, uh, let me lower this a little bit. Okay. All right, all the single ladies, all right. So what I'm doing here is with in terms of families, all right. So when we have kids on the spectrum, um, we tend to feel very isolated. And when we are isolated, we don't have like a lot of people who um, we feel that we can take our kids to. Um, many times, um, I'm looking at you. Remember you're my co-host, right? Right. Many times, um, we have situations where we are so caught up in our everyday lives, taking care of our children and making, you know, our day-to-day -day moves. We want to be able to let our hair down and visit and hang out with friends and family 
And, um, you know, it's difficult sometimes, difficult sometimes for us to just pick up and say, we're going to go visit this person or that person because we have situations where, yeah, really, because we have situations where um, our children are either hyperactive or they're loud or they're disruptive and not because it's intentional, but because it is something that unfortunately, unfortunately, but unfortunately, a lot of times they can't help. So in terms of empathy, I just kind of wanted to say like to family and friends of people who are connected to people like us, that we can, if we can take the time sometimes just to not only extend the invitation, but also extend the invitation knowing that when we come, we may have a runner. We may have somebody who is a little chatty or loud or maybe disruptive to your everyday flow. And if that's something that is um, difficult for you to deal with, for example, many people have very nice homes with a lot of nice charge keys all around. Why not just move them? The things that are really, really important to you. Because I want to come visit with you and my child or my family. And I don't want to be on pins and needles knowing that you have something um, really um, valuable that can get um, damaged. I don't want him or her to damage. Like, I don't want Zane. Zane, you don't want to damage anything, right? Right. Right. But sometimes inadvertently him running through or wanting to touch our curiosity, he will touch something or move something, or especially, I'm gonna suggest electronics, remove them because they're drawn to electronics. You out? Yeah, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, I'm out. See, I told you. Yeah. See you later. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Have fun. Okay, so um, things like electronics, maybe you might have CD, a CD collection, a DVD collection, um, books or whatever that may be of interest to the kids uh young people remove them just move them it's just a couple of hours out of your time just to make it a little bit more relaxing that's a lot of information you've given there um mm. Roseanne, you know i look at that whole piece that we've shown with with um the not not with just Zane, but with the logo for for oh, right. for your autism who knew. Yeah. Autism who knew. And then followed by, you know, the books that you uh <laughs> you have coming out, the covers, right? Right. And then followed by clips of you, one of them with you actually paying it forward to mm -hmm. an autistic child. Um well uh, he's he's an right. Because he's young, 18 now, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a young adult who was going forward to do better things with his education, how many subjects. Right, right. That was taking place in Jamaica. That was in Jamaica, right. And then, and then we fast forward here to your sweet and loving relationship with Zane. Your son, Zane, is a shining light for your family. It is truly your, your journey with Zane, who is on the autistic spec spectrum that you mm -hmm. You're in the business for advocating for autism. Tell us how this journey started. I mean, you've written the book, Situations in Autism, Who Knew? And as mentioned, there's the, the organization, Situations in Autism, Who Knew? Let's talk about how all of this is relevant in your life right now. Well, it's relevant because I'm still on the journey um, for people who are... Um, behind um i might be a good roadmap or a resource to uh, approach in terms of help and maybe you know guidance the people who are with it with me we're good as a, <laughs> a network and a support group to each other because we get to learn from each other um and for the people ahead of me i try to tap in 
to get guidance and um, information. So I think I'm a conduit, as plain and simple as that. I can do it through this journey of autism, where I'm an open conduit, willing to share what I've learned and what I'm learning and what I can learn. Yeah. So that's really where I am right now in terms of autism. But it's great. I got to tell you, um, I had to cut the clip that we just saw with you and Zane. It was longer. Yeah, much longer. longer. But I think although it was shortened, there was so much information that you were giving, just giving to the public, period. Not just for a new family with, mm -hmm. a, young with a young child who's diagnosed with autism. Mm -hmm. So for friends and family, I think that's right. all. You, I Thank mean, you. You're giving do's and don'ts. Please work with us. Right. You know, Thank you. Let's talk about that for a bit because I don't think that parents or mothers so to speak, because mothers are mostly the ones who are ahead of the game. Although I've met an, a father, I've met a father a couple of years ago who is the lead on parenting for mm -hmm. his, child, his daughter, who is mm -hmm. that autism. I mean, doing mm -hmm. wonderful work like Zane is doing. But I think we need to hear from, from you. We need to hear from mothers like you. We need to hear from advocates like you. I mean, just... Talk to us. Um, yeah, I think it's really important that if I have a voice and a, a platform that I should say what other mothers might be bashful or embarrassed to say or may not even want to. Um, being kind and inclusive may not necessarily, you might think it will take you out of your way to host your friend with their child on the spectrum for three, four hours, you know? But just think about it for a moment. That parent or parents are plugged in 24 seven. They're not getting a break, maybe only for school, but remember they're working as well. They just want a place to come where it's a safe haven. And I felt it necessary to explain that like we being West Indians, we like, why her child touching my stuff? Why she can't tell her son to sit down? Why he keeps stimming and explaining what stimming means, this repetitive motion of maybe spinning or screaming or clapping or, you know, packing up stuff in a certain order. Just learn to breathe through it. And then giving them simple tips. Declutter your house for that moment. It's not going to kill you. You know what I'm saying? You just want a place where maybe that child might just want to sit and look at a particular TV station and it might be a little loud. But if you are within, I say, visual, um, you can see that child eyesight. You can visit to the side, but not have to worry that your child is doing anything more than normal. After a while, it also helps the child because a routine of being able to be social will then let them know, well, I can do this because you can guide them as well. I'm not saying that you want your child to be running loose in somebody's place, but you want that the family to feel comfortable enough. Even if it was once a month, it is important for socialization, not only for the children, but for the families. So I thought it important to ask people to tap into their empathy and their kindness, to be able to open up their place, or even if you went to a picnic or whatever, help. Be the extra set of eyes. Learn not to yell because you cannot yell at these kids. Learn how to do redirection where they're fixated on something. You find something else for them to look at and negotiate. You will pick up a lot of skills that will help in your everyday life as well. Trust me. So, yes, it was important for me to speak on that. You know, I feel as though, <laughs> I feel as though we, we need to have another discussion. <laughs> Seriously, a whole nother discussion, a whole other discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, like my my um, Guyanese friends, a whole nother. nother. I mean, um, a whole other discussion on just autism. Absolutely. And I still think the two hours will not be enough. But I just wanted us to 
pretty much grease the wheels and have you talk some about it because I know how passionately you feel about autism advocacy given your son who plays a vital role in your life, of your, in the life of your family. Right. Rightfully so. You know, I just want to share my admiration for you. And oh, thank you. The work that you are doing in the community, but more importantly, how you are a stand-up parent. And I know your husband is right there next to you. A hundred percent. Without him. I know your daughter is right there next to you, you know. As well, yes. Hand up family for individuals who have a child that is diagnosed with autis uh, autism. And I think Zane's story is a true success story because he was co-hosting, he's high functional like you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and it really speaks to the awesome work that you're doing and the support that you're lending to Zane. I thank you. I thank you. Awesome. So we will make a soft arrangement here that you'll come back. Like, listen, you and I have a day together. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma just, just autism. I put on my social work hat and we will teach. I mean, that would be. I would love to actually maybe, maybe pull in one of either my behavioral therapists who is awesome. Okay. Um, who would give not only a human perspective, but really good points to help families who may be listening about how can you navigate certain things that are impeding your progress. So that's something as well I would like to maybe suggest. Sure, sure. We'll, we'll talk some more about this. Absolutely, absolutely. I don't believe it. Two hours went by. I'm shocked. Two hours went by. So when you told me two hours, I was like... I get it all the time. What can I say? I I get it all the time. I get it all. <laughs> so for my viewers out here, I really hope that, and you know what I hope for. I really hope that you get to learn something that's new and different when you tune in and you join us on Sundays. I really do hope that that happens for you. And I'm sure, like it did for me, it happened for you. You picked up. You learned a thing or two. On that note, as we bring arts, culture, and things in between with me, Rose October, to a close, I would like to thank you, viewership, for joining us yet another Sunday. And I, I want to take pause and say thank you to our guest today, our guest today, Roseanne Small Morgan, who has done it all plus some. She has done talk show hosting, radio show hosting, being a stand-up comedian. She has written and still writes for the Searchlight newspapers. She's writing columns. She is she's writing books. She is an entrepreneur. She has her own uh, non-for-profit agency that talks about, that addresses uh, autism. Uh, the name of that agency is uh, Autism Who Knew. Autism Who Knew. Mm -hmm. um, he has a book that doubles it, Situations in Autism Who Knew. Um, he is an advocate also for underserved populations. And of course, an advocate for families with a child who was diagnosed with autism. I had to say that twice. And she has given us a lot of information, food for thought, and I thank you. I thank you, thank you. I have to thank you for having me. Thank you so very much. You have made it a very comfortable space to speak and um, it has been truly a pleasure. So I wish you continued success with this platform. I really do. And I thank you for having me. You're welcome. So before I go, I have to put a plug in, you know, for the uh, engineer, my... Yes. Here, um, working along with us, um, our engineer working along with us, I must say, Rob. Right. <laughs> our engineer working along with us and viewership, the one and only. I have to say, there's no match for Raul De Silva, Raul De Silva of RDE Pros. 
thank you for your unselfish giving of doing this program with us. We truly appreciate you. I know that the masses don't know, but you also are giving back to other areas in our community. I sincerely thank you. I want to put in a plug for our Indiana Cultural Association to remind you that the virtual season has begun with a, uh, there was a webinar in June on Quekwe. It's con the season continues with the uh, SWS, uh, the, the series, the summer workshop series for the children. It's in mm -hmm. now. I think we have two more weeks to go. Kudos to Dr. Juliet Emanuel and team for making this a uh, really historical one because Excellent. they're from around the world, literally joining virtually. And this uh, summer workshop series, I think, has about two more weeks. Please go look for the Ghana Cultural Association Facebook page to get our lineup of events. Yes, we are going virtual this year. 2020, as Ghana Cultural Association celebrates its 20th anniversary. From me to you. Wow. Thank you very much for joining us. And hopefully you will be here again with friends next Sunday at 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Looking forward to seeing you then. And I'm on that note, I'm saying so long for now. Thank, Thank you. you.